quite a bit of detail in Jay Cloud's were in Brooklyn, pretty much in equal measure. Um, a lot of it will be describing kind of how it works and why. So useful for coders, accessible to non-coders who kind of understand the, the shape of technology. Um, and we'll start with how J Clouds lets you access 30 plus clouds, how you would use it, um, what its main concepts are when it's talking about remote clouds. Um, then we'll come into Whir. Um, within J Clouds, we'll show how we provision a machine and can set up Hadoop on that machine. Um, and we'll point to some of the, the difficulties for setting up a, a cluster. Um, in Whir, we will look at how Whir automates the, the, the multi machine cluster setup um, in a nice way and just makes it very simple to get started with a Hadoop installation. Um, and then we'll show how Brooklyn lets us weave that. Hadoop application into our web app. So we, we really end up with a worldwide application that is using Hadoop as its backing store. Um, so a, a quick word, I'm CTO and co-founder at CloudSoft. Um, Adrian Cole is the founder of JClouds and, and CTO for JClouds at CloudSoft. Um, and mainly CloudSoft are, are providing open source support and services around Brooklyn and JClouds particularly building complex enterprise applications and figuring out how do we improve Brooklyn and JClouds in the process. Um, so a, a little bit of housekeeping. There are two links um, on GitHub. You can um, get the tarball or zip ball for these projects or get it, work it, however you like. We won't assume that people have, but um, if you have, you can follow along and we'll have some, some things similar to what we're doing to play with. Um, I always like to have at least two of us doing this talk. Um, we've got a, a couple more people from CloudSoft in the audience and I think a few other people who know JClouds and um, were. So if you, if you hit some snags, um, raise your hand and we can answer them openly or, or come look, sit next to you. Um, so um, with that, um, so you want to build a Hadoop cluster. Um, I'll hand over to Adrian to talk about how JClouds takes a lot of the pain of getting the machines set up. Cool. I'll try to stay in my triangle, and I will also try to keep myself mic'd. Never mind the, uh, the green screen. So the way, uh, can folks hear me in the back? Cool. Uh, so the way I'm going to approach this, um, this talk, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a workshop where we're um, trying to review a lot of the concepts as well. And so we'll break for, for uh, you know, hands-on stuff in sections. Um, the workshop is structured where I believe it's, a, it's like a, an hour or so, and then there's a coffee break. And I'm going to review uh, Jake Clouds and the worst stuff um, nearing, nearing that point, and in, in a, an overall way. And then uh, that, that will give you a lot of the um, orientation to the technology when we start uh, digging deeper into Hadoop later. So I'm going to talk about some things that aren't necessarily only um, for Hadoop. Um, for example, you know, Whir is used for all sorts of things, including Cassandra and Hama and all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, and uh, so, so using this this style, you'll get it. You'll get an orientation of, of the things that are general, and we'll focus into the worldwide Hadoop. Um, you know, towards the end of the first half, and then throughout the second half. So. Um, uh, these are open source projects. A lot of people participate in them. Uh, JClouds has over 60 contributors. Um, particularly the content I'm, I'm talking about today um, has some uh, major parts that, that a lot of folks in these images have helped, helped me uh, produce. You've seen one of the guys, uh, Alex, if they look, you know. And then, but there's, there's also folks that aren't, aren't particularly close by. So, for example, Tom White at Cloudera, I think he's somewhere on a road trip across America on his way back to the UK. Um, Andrei Savu is over in, in Romania, and David Alves is over in Portugal. 
um, like most open source projects that are healthy, there's folks from all over the place. And we're lucky to be in front of you, but there's a lot of people um, you know, on IRC and otherwise that, that make these things work. Um, Alex already talked ego, so I'll, I'll skip that. So this section I'm going to be covering, um, I'm going to break it up into, uh, there's going to be three demos. First is just basically um, provisioning a node. Now how many here have a cloud account someplace? So those of you who have a cloud account, probably <coughs> JCloud will work with that cloud account. Um, if it doesn't, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it will take me at least 50 minutes to fix it. Um, and uh, for those who can, you know, try to eavesdrop on someone else or the screen here. Um, so the first, first demo will just be launching a node and, you know, executing some commands on it. Pretty simple stuff. Um, then we'll talk a little bit more about provisioning process, like what do you do when you're actually trying to create um, a, serp a, a service. Um, and uh, arbitrarily using Minecraft server as, as an example of uh, something you might hack your own service controller with, just because Minecraft's cool, it's also Java. Um, and then we'll talk about something, you know, getting into more serious stuff, where we're, which handles complex uh, clusters um, like Hadoop. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll hand off, um, and, and I'll work with, with Alex on the worldwide Hadoop thing. So that's sort of the, the way we're going to walk into the water here. So if, if you haven't worked with JClaws before, um, it, it's definitely an open source library. That's a, you know, a beer stein with a cloud on it. Hopefully it makes things easy, just like beer. Um, we, we try to make things idiomatic to the language that, that we're working with. So the JVM has over 250 languages now. Um, we have a strong community in a lot of languages, particularly Java and Clojure. Um, but there's plenty of folks that use like Scala and, and uh, you know, Groovy and such. For example, Cloud Bees use Scala on JCloud to do their provisioning. Um, yeah, we just happen to package closure bindings. It doesn't mean you can't use the other um, Java languages. Um, we definitely uh, focus on portability between clouds. It wasn't our first goal as a project, but we ended up there. Um, the fir first goal was actually just to make a reasonable S3 library. Um, and, and through that, dealing with, with web complexity and making some things that are hard to unit test, um, easier to unit test. So from a developer's perspective, you don't want to be um, you know, basically testing with your credit card if you can avoid it. Um, because JCloud started as, as a uh, plug-in to the InfiniSpan, which is a, a Red Hat JBoss project, it's a data grid, um, one of the first things we had to deal with was some thread safety <coughs> and, uh, issues. And when I say scalability, I'm really talking about inside the JVM. So um, we have a few abstractions, and the ones we're going to, most people think about um, is compute. But um, it started off as a blob story API, and so that's like key value pairs and stuff like that. Um, I'll get into a little bit what these abstractions look like on later slides. Uh, we also have a budding load balancer API, which works with uh, Rackspace and, and Elastic Load Balancers right now. Um, table will probably have a monitoring API soon enough. I know that Rackspace has a, a, a watch API. Uh, obviously, people have been working with Amazon CloudWatch. Um, we're hoping to see more products in, in, in monitoring feedback space um, that, that an abstraction would actually be meaningful. One thing we learned when, when building abstractions is that if you don't have at least three different APIs, you might as well not do it. Um, you, can, you can make a cleaner interface, but it's not necessarily going to be portable if you don't have more than one um, you know, implementation. Uh, because there's a lot of, of code in cloud APIs that is not normalizable across all of them, we, we have provider-specific hooks. So for example, you can reach down and, and get a hold of the Keystone API in OpenStack which isn't something that you find, like Amazon has no equivalent to Keystone service and nothing even remotely like it. Um, so there's no, there's no meaningful way we can make a portability library for something like that. So in the case that there, there's functionality that exists in one cloud and not another, you can get the raw API that we, we provide to do some things like that. Um, a lot of the JCloud's users um, are, are unsurprisingly Java applications. Um, or at least they run in the JVM. 
so we, we pay as much attention as we can to embeddability. Um, for example, our first challenge there was actually running within a PaaS called Google App Engine. Uh, how many folks here have actually heard of Google App Engine? And how many have put code into Google App Engine? <coughs> so um, Google App Engine has a restricted environment, um, and, it, and it allows you access to only certain things. For example, you cannot write to files because that would violate the PaaS contract, which basically say you're an application, not an OS. Uh, they don't let you spawn threads and all sorts of other things. So um, we actually have a demo in JClouds, which we can you know, do in another uh, open cloud conf, which currently, I believe, runs on six different passes. Um, and it has, it's basically doing the same Twitter demo where it would take uh, your, your mentions on Twitter and then store them in, in three blob stores or however many blob stores you happen to be configured. And it was surprising to find how many hacks you have to do to get that to work portably across every pass. And I think right now we, we're on um, Doc Cloud, uh, Heroku, op OpenShift, um, Cloud Foundry, uh, oh yeah, Google App Engine, <laughs> uh, and I think somebody else. Um, but but it's, it's more challenging than you think. Um, it, because basically inside of a PaaS, as you probably have heard, there, there are house rules and things you can do, things you can't do, scaling patterns that work, scaling patterns that don't work, and not all of that, that stuff is look, you know, you can't discover these capabilities quite cleanly yet. Um, so, so you can use JClouds within a PaaS. It is not a PaaS. It is not really a direct PaaS enablement software. So for example, people make PaaS enablement platforms and they might use JClouds to do some of the provisioning or storage part. But for example, if you wanted to take JClouds in its raw form and make a PaaS out of it, you'd have a lot of code to do. So it would be a better idea to look at some of the things, like for example, Alex mentioned earlier. We focus on the providers and the, the APIs. So providers are things like, for example, uh, Amazon S3 versus the API S3. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about um, you know, all of the implications of APIs, whether you're looking at it from a legal perspective or compatibility perspective. We have to maintain a lot of dialects to deal with this stuff. Um, we don't indemnify anyone for running an EC2 service that's not an Amazon. Um, but, uh, but basically, from an API perspective, we have to focus on a lot of these things. And, and the way that that represents in code is we have things that are called APIs, which are basically reusable things on different services, and things that are called pri providers, which are basically a binding of an API to a well-known endpoint, and metadata, for example, its location. And the location model is very important um, when you start working with, you know, global, you know, like for example, the, the, what we're going to do later with the Hadoop worldwide, because um, a location could be within the same provider, like, um, for example, I think Rayscale used to call multi-cloud running, um, running the same app in different Amazon regions, and, and now folks are, are starting to use multi-cloud in a more sort of different cloud providers perspective. Um, and so we use the, the word location to describe you know, a, a place uh, or a, a point of presence for a specific service. And so you could have you know, a service that's you know, working in the same city from a couple of cloud providers. They would have the same you know, uh, location code, but they would actually be different service providers. And, and so you can do a lot of interesting things with that. And, um, soft, and it's specifically Brooklyn has <coughs> examples of doing that. Uh, so the first API I'll show is not one we'll do any demos with, but just to show an easier one. Um, blob store is key value pairs, and people who aren't used to that lingo, key value basically means that you have <coughs> a, uh, a, a system that will allow you to assign a string and retrieve arbitrary bytes. There's no structure required, there's no structure implied, there's no structure constraints either. Um, and folks use this for durability, but they, some people use it as a primary data store for their application. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways you can use it. Um, container it basically separates some data from other data, it's just like a namespace. In Amazon, um, a container is a bucket, which happens to be a DNS um, uh, delineated namespace. So not all not all of the cloud providers use DNS. Some of them use like HTTP paths, um, and that that sort of thing can 
help you start understanding, um, you know, for example, is there going to be a namespace contention? Like, uh, if, a, if a cloud provider uses DNS, then you're going to be competing with whoever else is in that, you know, that same scope. So, for example, I'm not likely to be able to find a, a new container called Adrian, that, well, because I didn't reserve it fast enough. Uh, somebody else did. So, for example, same thing as like you know getting a Twitter ID or somebody else has it. It's a global namespace. And some of the providers, it's not global. So, for example, in Microsoft Azure, it's within your account, so you never have a name conflict that you didn't yourself create. Um, so even when we do with portability, there's some sort of like metadata, semantic stuff about what these things mean in their scope, which, which you still need to sort of know. Um, but what we do is we, we try to make it, um, you know, remove as much of those hurt, hurdles as possible. And uh, say you, f you happen to find a namespace no one else is using, like Adrian's movies, um, which I think probably isn't taken then you could upload your, your um, AVI of, of your favorite movies in, in this way, which, which in Java hope, hopefully should look reasonably clean um, and, and not look like a whole bunch of HTTP calls. It may happen to be a whole, whole bunch of HTTP calls, but, it's, but it wouldn't look like it. Compute service is um, more what a lot of people in cloud camps tend to, to think about, which is the IAS, um, the spinning up VMs and things like that. In JCloud, we use two uh, terms a lot uh, in the Compute API template, which is basically the requirement spec for your provisioning request. Um, so this could be which operating system family, or if, if you're bound to specific IDs, which IDs of images you might be using. Um, and, and other things like, for example, customization, what, what sort of script do you want to run as the admin user on that <coughs> operating system once this thing boots up. Almost all of the, the JCloss compute users just want to get something else to start. Like they, they want to kick off Puppet or Chef or something else like that or, or just run their, their commands they want. So um, JCloss focuses on these sorts of use cases where they're just, we're, we're trying to simplify um, that, that sequence you know, so, so that you, you can basically express yourself quite quickly. Uh, we optimize for groups um, and we're, we're not finished optimizing. There's a lot of stuff we can do um, to, to make it easier and more reliable to deploy larger and larger numbers of, of nodes at the same time. JCloud is a library, not a framework. So it, it provides us a lot of challenge in doing things like this. So for example, when you're a library, you're trying to um, be self-contained, not rely on, uh, on any services to already be running before you start up and all, all sorts of other things. And so um, we're, we have active discussions quite often about how we can optimize things and still remain a library. So this is what it, uh, what it looks like conceptually uh, to like bootstrap machines. So, for example, you might have a couple groups, um, you know, with different sizes or maybe the same size and maybe the same operating system family. Um, but if you were to look at, you know, the, the type of things that you need to have to run your application, you would have a group for each of those. And you know, where a group-based API, you can still create singletons. You just create a group of size one and don't add more nodes to it. So for example, there's some topologies you might need that need to have one and only one master. Well, just don't deploy more than one of them. And, um, and so we, we use this group. The other reason why we use the group idea is that not all, not all cloud providers allow you to name your hosts. Sometimes the naming part is, is something like you can only attach a name after you create the machine. There's all sorts of weird, weird clouds out there. What we found is we can reliably uh, tag a node with something that we can get, get a group out of. And we, sometimes we stuff them in fields that we're not supposed to use. But JCloud is, is stateless. It, it does not require anything that, that can't be stored in the Cloud API. So you can just bring it up whenever you want to. And that means that we, instead of having a data store like start up MySQL and start JCloud, which will connect to MySQL, we store everything in the API on the Cloud server. So we'll, we find some way of stashing this info someplace. And, and that's, that's part of the, 
the, the Julian interesting um, code that you come across is like, okay, how do you actually do that when they don't give you any writable fields? Uh, once you have your nodes running, uh, we operate based on predicates. We do that because we don't know what people are going to use these things for. If you think of yourself as like a run deck type of, of thing where you're doing data center automation, you might want to say um, what I'm affecting is, is different every time I run based on some, you know, maybe I'm going to have to query some, some database to figure out who's failed to check into a load balancer or something else like that. So um, we don't have a lot of... Um, application logic in JCause to say like, you know, um, reboot by name. You would, you would actually create a, a predicate that says named and then use that or named and also running or, or in this group with this subnet. And, and so we don't, we don't constrain you on how you actually want to operate things. And when, the, when your operations occur, they occur in parallel. So um, hopefully that, that sort of logic um, helps when you're, when you're dealing with increasing numbers of machines. Okay, and the code. Um, I'm just showing here a eucalyptus endpoint because they don't get much <laughs> <learning. laughs> Um But uh, basically, uh, if you're working with the, the JCloud's context and you're using an API as opposed to a provider, then you need to also supply the endpoint. Uh, at least. I mean, sometimes you need more properties. Almost almost never do you really, because we, we bake in defaults. Um, the other thing is, is that when I talked about modularity, there's some things we don't put um, as a core dependency of JClouds, but is a dependency of like compute. So for example, a, uh, a blob store doesn't really need an SSH client, so we don't make that as a, a dependency of JClouds itself. Uh, whereas a compute service, you're probably going to want to use SSH. So we have ways of passing in you know, your favorite library for those things so that we have the min um, as minimal um, dependency as possible. Um, and this is fairly recent to JClouds 1.5. We have uh, build view. So uh, what we've noticed is, for example, CloudStack um, has many views available on the same core set of APIs. So um, for example, uh, CloudStack has load balancing. Um, uh, VM provisioning, um, VLAN allocation, all sorts of other things uh, in their API set. So with the same connection to the server, I can do compute like node creation, deletion, I can set up load balancers and all this stuff. So we have, we have this concept that's reasonably new where we say that <coughs> one API is not necessarily bound to one functional set because sometimes they actually have a lot of functions they can like for example, in the case of Delta Cloud, Delta Cloud also can do Blob Store. So uh, Delta Cloud itself, as an API, can support every view we have. Um, and uh, once you get there, um, you get a handle of the compute service. And when you create your nodes, you have to give it a group. And this says create nodes and group. This does not say create group. Uh, there's a reason for that. So uh, we don't. Um, we assume you know what you're doing. So if you're, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, because trying to trying to like, you know, uh, make sure that there's one and only one of something, is actually leads to a lot of complex logic that hardly ever works very well. Um, so if you say create nodes and group, it's going to create at least, you know, if that didn't exist, it will create one. If it already existed, it will create the next. So uh, we don't we don't actually keep track of what you did beforehand. That's your job. Uh, there are tools that do this. For example, Palette, uh, which is in Clojure, um, has a converge command, and that will make sure that that is to the degree that Palette doesn't have another Palette running simultaneously. Um, it will make sure that there's whatever that count is. Um, but as a core library, we don't we don't deal with that. Um, most people are only interested in these two things: um, what ports to open up on the firewall, and what to run as soon as it kicks kicks up. Um, and this is uh, this is the basic like value prop. I mean, it doesn't have to be more complicated than this. Um, as soon as you can kick off your JBall server or your Chef or whatever you're doing, then that's we're we're happy just to have facilitated that because it's quite hard to actually get this stuff to work reliably on lots of things, and and, and we try to keep our scope pretty well constrained in JClouds. Um, and uh, you know, we currently inherit sort of this public-private address thing from, from Amazon. 
um, I don't actually think is a very good uh, sustainable way of thinking about addresses uh, because what is public anyway, especially in a private cloud, what is public? Um, and is it really about a shortcut to public IP ranges that I could just calculate using bitmath? Um, so so there, there's a lot of things that we've, we've come across along the way to creating jclouds, you know, three years later that I think we may, we may have some, you know, maybe in a jclouds 2, a, a different way that's maybe more like the way OpenStack looks at addressing and stuff like that. So I think we're ready to actually do some things. Um, for those of you who are, are gettable, um, please clone this repo. Um, for those of you who are not, watch someone else. Um, so this repo we have, uh, jclouds examples, is where we unsurprisingly stash our examples. Um, and there's a lot of examples here, and we hope to have more over time. Um, so just to give you a quick intro to how we do things, um, generally speaking, um, in, in open source, the way I, I learned to, uh, I haven't actually done a lot of open source before jclouds, to be honest. I just worked on um, the InfiniSpan, and then before that, another project called Cargo. Um, and the way that I learned to work very well in open source is to use uh, unit tests as your documentation, because people are much more likely to write them and they're much less likely to lie. Um, so if you want to know how to use something, first thing you do is look for unit tests, because they probably work. Um, and if they don't work, then you know exactly how to make a bug for it, because you've got the test right in front of you. Um, the other thing that's a good practice is to have um, examples, because these are also things that you can compile and run. You can fork them. You can modify them. And um, so. You can see that some of these things we haven't kept up to date. We have an HDFS example we haven't done lately. Um, but when you clone this repository, um, you would basically get to the point where you have all these things in your workspace. And um, we'll start with Compute Basics, um, which has the uh, instructions of what to do on the, uh, you know, on this this thing here. So. Um, so the, the thing is with, with cloud demos is that normally they're like, um, you know, run this command and wait five minutes and either stand awkwardly or you, you talk about what's, what's going on while it's going. And I'm going to take that approach. So I'm going to actually start the, uh, start the Compute Basics demo and then we'll talk about it because there's a little bit of time. So uh, one thing you can see here is that um, in the, in the README, uh, what this demo does is it adds nodes to a group and allows you to execute arbitrary commands on them or destroy the group. Um, so this is kind of like a nice quick start. Um, we have some example syntax in case you don't know, like for example, what the keys are for the various providers. Um, Amazon EC2 or HP's cloud, which is an OpenStack one, or TriStack if you've, if you've registered. How many folks have, have heard of TriStack? Um, so TriStack is is uh, a free service uh, that's run from the donation do, donations of a lot of uh, of companies that are participating in OpenStack, and I think I think you have to use a Facebook account, unfortunately, but um, you can log in and basically get like OpenStack bugs, and so you can start spinning up machines um, or using storage uh, to the degree that you have some sort of credits to do that. So a lot of times people like things like OpenStack, but they need a lab and they don't have a lot of machines hanging around. So uh, TriStack's a nice way. If you don't have a cloud account and you want one that won't cost you anything, there, there's, a, there's a quick and easy one for you. Um, if you're running your own private cloud, there's example syntax here. Um, because, for example, private cloud, who knows what your image is? You, you uploaded it yourself. How would we know what that is? So we have some. Um, ways to like specify what ID you want or what the login user to that image is. Um, if you're working with VirtualBox, um, you know stuff like that. So anyway, let's go ahead and do it. So let's see. So I have my checkout here, um, and uh, so if we look at the README, which is the same text you just saw, uh, you have all this stuff. The first thing it tells you is make sure you, you run maven install. 
Um, if you've not ever installed Maven before, it's very easy. It's, it's a zip file, you unzip it and you put it in your path. So what I'll do is I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna kill my Maven and then I'm just gonna make it work again. So I have Maven here, so just nuke it. Um, now I'm gonna pretend I didn't know where it was. And so what do I do? I go Google, okay. Uh, where do I download Maven from? Right. So I'll click here and I'll find something. And it looks like it has a slightly newer version than I was running. So I'll just grab the uh, tar GZ where you can choose zip, whatever you feel like. And just grab that sucker. <coughs> and because we're probably going to overload uh, the poor network here, I maybe shouldn't have nuked my. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not so bad. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go to where I want to extract it to, and uh, yeah. downloads Apache Maven. Okay, so now it's Apache Maven, right? So I can do export path equals I know this is really uninteresting, I'm just giving you time to clone stuff. <laughs> okay, now I can I should be able to do Maven again and if it doesn't work then oops. I did something wrong. Okay, so um, now I have uh, actually two places that I can uh, I can build into scheduled time to talk about things. One, downloading things that didn't work, and then actually waiting for this, the server to start. So um, what does this code do? Um, I'll start talking about that and then the other download should finish. So um, if I'm using Eclipse, um, you know, we, we didn't put everything in one class because we think that's good software design. It's just to make it simple for people to, to hack, hack on. Um, what this application has are add, run, exec, and destroy. And so these commands are add, meaning we're gonna add another machine. Run, we're gonna, we're gonna run a command in quotes, like echo hello. Um, I'm sorry, uh, exec is like echo hello. Run is to execute a script that I have on my machine on that remote host. So for example, if I have a script to uh, install uh, Chef or whatever, I could, I could just point it to that file and it would, it would invoke on the, on, the, on the other side. And then uh, destroy would be um, destroying all those machines. So um, one thing in JCloud we have is we have a way to search for different sorts of APIs. So for example, I can, I can look for APIs that have an ID. For example, EC2 is an API. Um, I can uh, look for all APIs that are viewable as compute service context versus blob, blob store um, and uh, stuff like that. And then if I have a provider, I have even more stuff because a provider, like I said, is an API plus metadata. So I can look for providers that are in the same ISO code. If you haven't 
if you haven't looked at ISO codes before for location, um, ISO is a, is, a, is, a, is a 3166 is a standard. And uh, a couple of years ago, we had a talk with a lot of people who are non-Java about what's the best way to refer to location for cloud APIs. And so uh, we settled with ISO 3166 codes. It's very simple. It's like US hyphen CA for California or IE dash whatever it is for, for Dublin. Um, and and there, there's you know there's a hierarchy there's there's tables there, it's predictable it's a standard it's not going to change um, so you know, I think probably my download is finished yep so let's try try this again oh great. Okay. No, I'm having so many problems today. Do you want to So, what's up with my. <laughs> This was the simplest part of the whole thing, and <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So the script in Maven. Uh, oh, you know what I have to do? I'm sorry. I know why. Sorry. Yes. <coughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> so so uh, wherever you unzip the thing, uh, do m2 home. Um, I set and forget my environments, and normally I don't nuke myself, and uh, this is just part of the format. Right? OK, so what were we doing? So I unzip the file, I put m2 home, and now I can go into the examples directory, which I cloned. Um, and if we don't want to trust anything, we'll just allow for even more entropy. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and clone it. Uh, so if I, if I look at jcloud's examples, uh, I would just double click whatever this is here. and do git clone. I, and I'm only doing this because I know there's probably <coughs> at least one person here who hasn't used git. Um, and so after this finishes, I'll have the repository. Um, uh, JCloud's examples. And then I'm going to go to Compute Basics. And then I'm going to do it, Maven uh, install. Which, what this will do is this will actually create a, uh, a zip file that has all the code in it and all of the dependencies for everything. And so basically, you get one jar file that, that you can use to, to do your, your uh, favorite provisioning commands. Um, I have a lot of cloud accounts. Um, and, uh, you know, I could use uh, Amazon uh, or, or anything else. So I'll probably just, uh, maybe I'll use Rackspace. I'll, I'll use Rackspace. Hopefully, they are not failing today. So I'll just grab my credentials. So yeah, I'll use I'll even use Rackspace UK has that. So what I'll do is I'll do, I'll cat the README and then I'll get get the syntax. So it created a jar file, this compute basic jar with dependencies, it's a big jar. If you look at the size of it, it's a monster. But it has all, you know, everything it needs inside. So, like 14 megs, monster, right? Um, and so I use cloud servers dash UK, and uh, 
my identity, so J clouds, and then the secret key, create a group, maybe in my group, and add. And so this is going to, unsurprisingly, add stuff. Um, so in J clause, we have this provider metadata key. So let me use a different one. I'll use US because I don't feel like troubleshooting another thing right now. And this is a cool thing when you start doing multi cloud, is that you have about like two seconds attention for a bad cloud. <laughs> it's like okay. I'll just use another one. <laughs> and then eventually you get your, your job done. And that's sort of like, um, so you want to be that cloud that they don't switch from. <laughs> In this case, obviously, I'm also work, working with Rackspace again in the US. But, um, and of course, it was my problem that I, I probably you know, let my key expire. But um, what's going on here is that we're, we're going to print out the metadata we have about this cloud. Um, for example, it's friendly name. Um, that provider metadata object that we have uh, that you can query against can let you build really nice GUIs because you can get friendly names. So even if there's 30 clouds, you don't have to like know all the, all the names <coughs> or everything. Um, we even keep the doc links so that, so that you can point, like you can have a mouse over and then you know, have them click to sign on or create whatever. Um, and then in this case, what we're doing, there's two ways you can, you can do things in JClouds. You can either search for things by um, by ID, or you can search by value. So when you search by value, uh, things are a lot more portable. Um, but you're not quite sure what you're going to get. So for example, if I say I want to search for you know Ubuntu anything in this regex pattern, basically I, I could be getting a Nyric, I, I could get, you know, Precise, I could get any, any of their builds that, that fall in that category. So your stuff better work in that range. Um, and if you know about operating system distributions, you know that there's minor releases of them. So you're sort of rolling the dice and you go by value. Um, and it's nice for getting started with portable code because you can, you can start to test and see um, you know, what does it feel like on this cloud versus what does it feel like on this cloud without knowing what their IDs for things are. But when you start working with your you know, more production-like situations, you almost always end up coding the exact IDs. Like this, it's exactly this image because that's what I used. Um, so it's a nice way to, to switch between those worlds. So you can say, do your really exploratory work with by value, figure out the configuration you like, then lock it in for production. And JClouds has this query, so uh, for example, in the logs you can see it's matching a specific hardware ID, it's matching a specific image ID, and then you get the provider-specific interpretation at the end of it. So for example, in uh, cloud servers, there's, a, which is Rackspace's server pre-OpenStack, uh, pre, uh, um, they didn't have the ability to assign servers to a specific region or location. You can only just go, and it might pop up in uh, Dallas or, or Chicago. Uh, but there's no way for you to control that process. I know that when they flip the switch, they, they're in a private beta of the OpenStack stuff. It's probably going to change, and you'll be able to assign things directly. But basically, inside of, of JClouds, we're at the mercy of the cloud provider. So the cloud provider does not allow you to choose a location. We cannot choose a location. Um, so this, the other thing we do is, like I said, you know, sometimes we have to stuff name wherever we can go. So for example, that group, in the case of cloud servers, it ends up being encoded in the name of the server. Whereas, for example, in EC2, it would be encoded in the name of the security group. Wherever we can stuff this information, we, we, we will stuff it there. Um, so while this is coming up, um, we'll go back to the code. So you know, besides like parameter validation, uh, let's look at what Add did. So Add uh, ran Template Builder. And if we happen to have parsed minimum RAM, um, then we would have uh, you know, changed from the default to whatever that value was. Otherwise, it would be whatever the smallest size there is in that cloud. So for example, if you look at what happened on, on uh, Rackspace, 
it turned into flavor number one, which is, I think, the 256 meg, really small host. Um, then, um, once we find our size, uh, we have we have some some Java code to do some standard things that a lot of people ask for. So, for example, you know, quite a few folks when they're booting up a machine want to get an admin user on it. Like, like that's the first thing they want because then they can troubleshoot any other things that fail. So uh, we have this object called admin access, and it does a bunch of things. Um, it locks out password authentication. Uh, it sets up uh, sudo rules. So you have the wheel account, and you can do passwordless sudo. It will set up the same user that you are you're logged in currently with on the remote. It'll add the user, authorize it to the group, uh, swap the SSH keys, and, and basically do everything to the point where you don't need to know what the user was on that image. And that's really important for portability because, um, say, I, I you know if I'm working in a vCloud, almost all the Ubuntu distributions in a vCloud are logging in with a root user. But if I go to almost everybody else's Ubuntu distribution, it's the user called Ubuntu. And so I then need to like have an if statement or try and figure this out, like what user is on the remote host. If you leave that stuff um, to jclouds to sort out, then you don't even have to care whether it was root or whether it was Ubuntu. It will lock out that user anyway. And it will create a new one for you as soon as it can. Um, so there's there's going to be like a brief second where where that user isn't locked out, and normally that doesn't matter because a lot of times the uh, uh, those users have a, a gen generated password or they'll have an SSH key, but don't always assume that because for example I can create an image anyway I could I could create an image with a with a canned password that nobody changes, um, so when you look at a cloud. Um, like, for example, one of, the, one of the problems I used to have with, with Terramark was that um, they would have a well-known password for all of their operating system distributions. And I would start getting email from their call center saying, someone has taken over this server and are using it for a mail relay. Okay. And I'm like, well, guys, randomize your passwords. You know? <laughs> but, but what we found is just running tests so often that people were discovering the IP ranges and just like basically waiting for a test to go off taking over those servers and then you know spamming people. So that's that's actually the real reason why this was created. <laughs> it also happens to be very handy. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're gonna run only this, which is basically to set up that user and and then get the user and then after that we'll print out its IP addresses. Um, and then so we create uh, we found that like SSH connections are really unreliable. So we do all of our customizations in an init script fashion. So we create an, an init script on the, on the back end host. We kick it off. And then we just pull until it's finished. Because that way, if we have an SSH connection break, it's not as painful. Um, so here, it uh, looks like it finished uh, creating a machine. Here are the IP addresses. Um, I echoed hello. And then said hello. So now if I were to say exec, uptime, <coughs> then you know it should it should have an unsurprising result. Um, and if I ran it again, um, it would it would add another node to that group. So from uh, this perspective, when it's doing this, it's actually looking up all the metadata about the cloud, and then it's going to do this. Because we know that this created an admin user, we could do it much faster, which is we could just you know, well, I'll wait for it to finish since it started. All right, see, up time. I could have just done this because it set up the admin user for me. And if I want to do anything else, um, because this user is, is pseudo accessible, um, I could I could do any of these things, um, and um, normally normally these connections aren't quite as slow as it is right now as far as the SSH connections, but it's one thing that is important to keep in mind that your cloud could be very far away from you, and where your controller is matters. Um, so so if you're particularly we have we had when we were working on Ninefold over in Australia, um, 
you know, I think I started working on that when I happened to be in Tel Aviv. That's about as many hops as you can get. And, and it was like doing anything took a really long time. Even the API response, and it was not, not their fault at all. It's just that being very distant from your servers can be a pain. So um, that leads to very interesting new problems to solve. Like how do you, how do you make your provisioning system location aware? And so that's some things actually that Brooklyn can do. Um, so if we're all right, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Um, and if anyone wants to dig more into this demo, we can catch me later. Um, so we provisioned a node, and I forgot to turn it off. Um, so if we're thinking about building a cluster, it's more than just echoing hello on a machine. Um, there's relationships for you to deal with and sequence and stuff like that. Um, the first thing you're, you're going to want to do is like look at the, look at the topology of that cluster um, that you need and, and break it down into roles. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at HBase, which is built on top of Hadoop and also Zookeeper, um, when you start, you know, pulling it into its piece parts, you find that there's like some Hadoop stuff, there's some HBase stuff, and then there's a Zookeeper. We heard um, last night at the Cloud Camp that uh, Cloud Foundry is broken into 40 pieces. Um, so, some, you know, there could be an arbitrary number of pieces to actually create whatever platform or whatever product that you're actually building. And the most important thing is that you know what those pieces are if you're actually going to start creating a, a topology um, that includes them. So when you analyze these, you, you start understanding the relationships. And it's not magic. I mean, you have to know what the product's doing and, and, and what makes sense for it. Um, in, in the case of a lot of uh, clusters, you'll find that there are some pieces that don't need to scale so much. And there are some pieces that scale in relationship to the amount of data or the amount of requests. And, and there's some pieces that really should be on the same host, um, or at least the same network. And so, you, you know, once you start analyzing those things, um, you, you can get a better handle on what you're actually trying to build and a sensible way to build it. So, for example, you wouldn't put all pieces on the same machine um, and then make 100 copies if only one piece actually needs to scale out. So what's the size of the piece on uh, what, what's the size of these? So, for example, in the case of Hadoop, um, and, and where we're not going to talk about later, I think uh, we're defaulting to a machine that has at least eight gigs of RAM. It's for nodes or for I think it's actually fairly simplistic. I think it's actually using uh, uh, M1 larges for everything, but the. Tuning is a different thing, so, so don't take this answer as actually the right size. Um, for example, the, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yeah. uh, so what, once you understand what you need to, to deploy, and you haven't tuned yet, but you, you understand what, what sort of things you, in, in the general broad stroke structure, um, they're still actually rolling it out, right? So what we just did, um, before was just provision. We didn't actually install anything. We, I mean, sort of. We put an admin user on the box, but uh, we didn't like put any binaries down. We didn't get anything from you know some Debian repo or whatever that's needed for the software to run. Um, we certainly didn't configure anything outside of the sudo rules. Um, and um, you know, and then even after you configured and brought up your software, you need to manage it. Um, so in the case of provisioning, um, you know, like I said, there, there's, uh, in the case of uh, the demo I was just talking about, this one happens to be 8 gigs of RAM. Um, but you could say, like, for example, the REST server component is a fairly lightweight system. You could just run that on a very small instance or at least a smaller instance. Um, but when you talk about provisioning, normally we're talking at the IAS level where you're talking about machines and networks. And those machines are operating systems, or not yet applications or services. Um, so you've got roles, and then in, on the installation, I'm really talking about rolling out, you know, rolling out the dependencies for these things what, um, before they can start. So without the binaries, without the logins, and, and everything else, without Java, for example, you can't start a Java process. We saw that even something simple can, can be easily screwed up, like I totally screwed up my Maven install, right? Um, the configuration is like the fun part. And there's a lot of tools to do this stuff. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, we're in Brooklyn do this in this talk. But obviously, 
configuration management is a fascinating uh, field that's gaining age, surprisingly. Um, I mean, it's been a long time since Puppet came out. Puppet was inspired. Uh, you know, so we have CF Engine, Puppet Chef, all, all these other tools out there, and even some new ones that are sort of blending these areas together, like uh, Juju and stuff like that. Uh, but configuration is once you have everything there, you brought it up, you're configuring them to connect to sensible things. So, like, I'm going to listen on the right network, and I'm going to connect to my cluster on, on the correct network, and they know about each other. Um, and then finally, you get to, to management, uh, where you're on. Maybe you need to, to swap out unhealthy machines. Maybe you need to, to do a, a regular backup so that in case a disaster happens, you can restore that information someplace else. So you can make a cluster manager with the stuff uh, you know, that I showed you. You'd have a lot of code to do because <laughs> Like, you know, we've got code built in to get to the provisioning part, but there's all this, all this, you know, else out there. Um, but there are people doing it. Um, you can also uh, start with, with other projects. I'm going to show you what, what a, uh, if you were to try to do something yourself, might start looking like, and then I'll show you um, how, how we look at this with work. So I'm using a very fun example, um, Minecraft. How many here have ever heard of Minecraft? So Minecraft is a fairly popular game. I think it's like well over a million uh, paid subscribers. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very simple uh, game. It's a simple server. It's a Java process. It's a simple client, which is a Java process. Um, it's not a very complicated cluster. And, and I'm intentionally not choosing a complicated cluster. Um, but, uh, but it's fun. And uh, we, we met up with the Minecraft guys over in uh, in Sweden, where they where they operate from, and when you look at how something would work in in, um, in a game, so for example, you know when you start up a game, somebody needs to find out where the server is, um, or are they going to run it themselves? And uh, so what this demo is going to do is going to bring up a server for for the game to connect to, and I'm just going to um, connect to it and put an IP address here. Um, so. Same examples, you know, if you, if you look at uh, the JCloud examples, there's also Minecraft compute, compute. This is just, like say you wanted to build your own thing, this is what it would start looking like. Um, and again, I'm going to do Maven clean install. This time I'm not going to lose 10 minutes. I thought I wasn't going to lose 10 minutes. Um, let me go over here. Minecraft. Um, so I'm going to build my jar, and, and what's this jar going to do? It's going to start up other stuff. This is using the same general syntax as the you know bringing up a machine that we just did with with Rackspace. So it's going to but it's going to take a little bit longer because we're not just um, installing our user. Now we're going to actually put the software on it and we're going to run it. So we're going to take it from just getting a node to actually doing something with it. And so I'm actually going to steal my shell history. Uh, so I kept the readme. So it looks the same way. My group add, my group destroy, stuff like that. But it's just going to do more. Um, so, so I'm just grab the credentials here. And uh, So Java minus jar, blah, blah, blah. And then let's do my group add. So again, unsurprising, I'm gonna, it's going to create a server. It's going to do, um, it's going to do more. By the way, uh, if we look at this, it didn't use the, um, the size one because Minecraft actually needs more memory than the, than the minimum. So it's actually using more stuff. It also, um, if I, as I said earlier that when you're installing something, um, you know, you've got you know, provision and then installation. In this case, it's actually going to bleed into that installation phase and actually install Java on there. Um, and configure is really simple, but I'll show you what the code looks like. So while this is waiting for other stuff, 
I'm going to go to another thing called main app and under the Minecraft compute here. And So this, I've, instead of having just one main class, is broken up into pieces. So remember I said install, configure. Um, so we have a class here for configuring Minecraft. And what I've done here is I've said, okay, give me the URL of Minecraft server. Uh, give me a minimum heap size this thing needs to run on. And then I'm basically creating an init script to, to kick off this daemon. Um, in this case, uh, I definitely want to name it. Um, I'm going to set up my, my Java args. So Java is a, is a reasonably easy process to start up. So it's not a very complicated setup. I'm not doing anything networking related here. I'm just starting up the thing. In the controller, um, I have a bunch of commands. So I've implemented a more, uh, a more specific interface than machines. Um, and I'm calling this Minecraft controller. So if I look at my commands, I have, I have list, I have add, um, create node with Minecraft, you know, get the PIDs that are of the running processes. And so generally speaking, when you make controllers, you want to try and find some abstraction that's closer to the problem domain. In this case, Minecraft doesn't really care about the operating system because you can have 20 Minecraft servers on the same host. Uh, it's more about you know IPs and ports that it's listening on, and so in this case you'll see that when I'm creating a node with Minecraft, I'm arbitrarily bumping up the memory by 256 megs to give the operating system something to work with, uh, because you know while this is a Java process, there is still an operating system running Java, and um, and then I start the daemon, and in this case um, we talked earlier about this admin access standard. There's another thing we have built into JClouds to install an OpenJDK. Um, and so these two get you a really long distance with Java-based components like, like Hadoop, um, but there's still more to go from there. So um, the other thing I'm doing here is I'm adding in some extra metadata. So for example, I'm gonna name this machine um, just so that it, it might happen to look nicer in GUIs. Um, and, uh, and then once I'm finished uh, bringing up the machine, I'm actually gonna do the configuration, which is the start Start the uh, start the daemon. And yeah, go ahead. So, do you have any experience in uh, GNI or like launching native apps here? Um. So. Right. So I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, so, for example, the weird thing about Jake Flaws is that it actually is a system to deploy remote machines. Right. So. So, for example, uh, J and I in this case um, is is going to get to this same, my current machine. Um, so, if I were to make something like that was native, I would probably just give it a, a script or the binary data for it to run on a remote machine, as opposed to using a J and I hook. So, the reason I brought that up is I like J clouds. I like the Java interface which is there. Uh -huh. But when you want to run performance stuff, you want to be close to the hardware. I mean, um, I haven't had anybody ask to um, to do uh, J and I on J clause yet, but uh, we have had we have had some folks that, for example, if you look at Blob Store, that could be something that that you know that you you might want to do something like that. And um, anyway, let's see if it it started up here and. Or is that starting? Oh, it hasn't started. Um, so I probably ran out of time, didn't I? Uh, it's fair. <laughs> yeah, it will work. 
there's a lot more to do. The, the network is going very slowly. So I waited 20 the minutes for a machine. Week here. So what I might do is, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and just do our quick intro to Word, and then, and then see if this thing finished starting. For the whole thing? Yeah. Oh. Oh, so we had, we, did we blow for our coffee break? Sorry. No, I don't think so. No. Okay. okay. Well, it's like 2.30ish on the pressure schedule. Well, we don't run until close, great. And I know I'll check on the schedule, actually. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Why don't we, yeah, I think we're here for the rest of the day. <coughs> In which case, let's run this through to the coffee break and then do... Cool. 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 Yeah, so, sorry guys, I, I uh, Yeah, here's some four. There's a coffee break here in five ten minutes. Cool. So uh, we'll we'll let that thing spin and do stuff. So where's another way to do it besides right I mean so so for example, yes, there's some proof. You can start writing tools. Um, and um, you can make some fun tools that way. It's it's a nice hobby. There are lots of tools that, that Alex had mentioned that are already sort of there to do this stuff. Where's one of them? I'm also a contributor on to Word. What Word does is it takes the idea of machines and it raises the abstraction level a little bit higher to composable services. And and we mean composable truly, meaning that um, you know you can take uh, pieces like a module for a Zookeeper and use pieces from uh, even monitoring stuff like Ganglia and then compose uh, systems that include all of them. And so it's, it's kind of a, um, it's raising the abstraction and changing it from a, from a, bunch, of, a bunch of machines to roles that, that are serving your, your cluster. So this is actually not accurate. Uh, for example, HBase has a bunch of components, so this is not realistic. But you can, you can just see for, if you were using Java API, we would start defining each of the roles and, and you know, how many machines they might be running those. Um, a lot of people just use the command line uh, API. Like, for example, there's a lot of people that use the uh, EC2 you know, um, command line tool um, that happens to be a Java tool that never know it's Java because they never really looked. Um, and there are folks that use Word that may not even care that it happens to be written in Java. But um, if you use, uh, this is really, I'm not getting any love with the, with the you know, the green font here, but um, saying launch cluster, naming my cluster, and then saying the components of it. In this case, I want one master and six region servers. Like I said earlier, that wouldn't have worked because HBase needs more components than that. Um, inside, what's happening is, is that uh, Word has a few phases. And the nice thing about Word is it, is it simplifies things because there's only a few things that it, it permits you to do. Um, so for example, if we think about configuration and then we think about it a lot, and then we think about it a lot more, you could come up with any arbitrary number of steps in a workflow to provision something. On the other hand, if you say there's only three, bootstrap, configure, destroy, then it's a lot easier to code. Um, so there, there's a balance here. Words made to try to make things very uh, quick and, and as reliable as possible, but it doesn't actually lend itself to be, you know, the, the a, a replacement for uh, config management. So in Bootstrap, it's going to create the cluster and then run a script to install the static stuff. And then it blocks at a barrier for all those machines to become available. At that point in time, you have the IP addresses of all of the machines around you, and you can start configuring things. And so it's configure action We'll start configuring like firewall rules to make sure the machines can talk to each other, bring, uh, write configuration files, and then um, bring up those services. Destroy actually destroys the nodes. So it doesn't actually require that. Uh, we actually do have a phase to run a script on destroy, but you know, obviously you could do that or not do that. Is there uh, some kind of testing phase once configuration is done before bringing up services? You want to do some kind of test to make your firewalls are in or VPN, etc. Is there some intermediate? Yeah, I'm trying to think in the code if there is any right yet. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we actually have barrier checks for each of these things. Um, 
But I think that the idea of smoke tests at various phases is something that, have, that people have talked about pretty often. And it, I don't think it would be that hard to, say, put in a hook to, to do it. But the problem with it is that it's hard to do it uh, without specific knowledge to those components that you're creating. Um, so for example, you can check the exit codes, did something, but did the shell script return an exit code? And so, so like the relative state of health is something that's that's easy to do once you already have the service done. Um, but like saying which phase and which QA processes, um, these are a little bit harder, especially for something that's doing this in shell scripts. So um, it's a longer discussion. I think the short answer is is probably I don't I don't think there's any code in there yet about that. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about uh, after the testing done, the spam takes over, right? I mean, people get in and oh. don't have access to the cluster and somebody's using it. Have you thought of um, sending a poison pill to each of the components and they just shut down? Siri. So um, you mean if, if somebody knows that they're taken over or something? Correct, correct. Because if you don't have access to that, I mean, shutting all of these things down is really big. By the way, my Minecraft server finally works. Um, it's slow because the network's awful, but uh, judging by this piece of the screen that you can't see, it, it actually did work. Um, anyway, uh, we don't focus on, on um, we, like for example, JClouds doesn't actually have a discrete focus on uh, lockdown. Um, so for example, uh, you would probably, what you would want to do is use a config management system like Puppet or Chef, and actually put in your own lockdown <coughs> routines as a configuration phase. For example, I will talk about in a second that in where you can actually throw in Puppet manifests that you want to execute. And so if you have your own poison pills, you could totally do that. Um, so bootstrapping is essentially you know, creating your nodes um, and actually you know, setting up the, the base environment. Configuration is running a script to either directly configure things or kick off something else to configure things, like for example in our Puppet or Chef support. And destroy actually is, is two things. It, it runs a script and also can destroy the machines. Um, so, you know, when you get there, you're like, wow, everything's perfect, right? But it, actually it never is. So, so we didn't stop coding when we got there. Um, for example, there are folks here that have used anything in this world I found that like your biggest problem you end up dealing with is SSH, um, the limitations of shell scripting, doing things at scale, doing more than 10 machines at a time, chokes up all sorts of things. We're still working on some of that. Um, some of the things we added in, in versions uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is, is nearing completion, but what we have in 0.7 that's out there today, we have puppet support, chef support, we have stuff like ganglia support that you can weave into your clusters. Um, so for example, if you use configuration management, you can do things like you mentioned, like add some lockdown stuff. For example, if you're using puppet manifests, you can specify rules like log rotation or setting up my muting configuration. Um, as long as you give where a way to find your modules, either a GitHub repository or a tar file. And you know, and it's, 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 it's a generic handler. Uh, we have only a couple implementations yet, but we also have a chef implementation where you specify uh, cookbooks and roles within the cookbooks instead of, of puppet manifests. And so you can end up with stuff like this where your cluster definition is, you know, on one machine I want Zookeeper, but I also want arbitrarily an Apache server that was configured with Puppet and an NTP okay. server that was configured with Puppet. So you, you can do stuff like that. And that's, that's where you can sort of mix and match um, you know, tools that, that work with tools that you know, harden things. And uh, the configuration management piece was interesting. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of how we wrote that, but feel free to ask me later. Um, and we're working on some other things, um, including cluster resizing, healing, which is basically if a machine goes, to, goes down for for the reason that the cloud decided to kill it. Um, how do you actually restore service to that cluster? And, and a lot of it actually bleeds right into Brooklyn um, because we have a lot of tools um, at a higher level than even, even were. 
So I think without further ado, we could start the intro, then do our coffee break, and then get right into the worldwide Hadoop. Is that good? Good. All right, guys. Thanks. So what uh, Adrian hasn't said is sort of a little bit about the, the origins of were. Um, it originated around Hadoop, as you may know, um, because um, people face the problem that uh, many of you may face. Um, that setting up a new installation gets quite complicated. There are a lot of cluster and you know, config files that all need to be set. Thank you. Just so. Um, so the, the sweet spot for were the, the origination was Hadoop, um, and now there are a number of things in the ecosystem, HBase, um, and uh, Mahi, Pig, Hive, and several things beyond the ecosystem, like Chef and Puppet. Um, it's, it's attractive as a, a lightweight way to describe the, the, the provisioning of a service on a machine and then combining these. Um, we'll focus on Hadoop. Um, I think we'll, we'll maybe do that after the coffee break. Um, I've put up here the properties file which we will run. Um, and I'd also like to direct folks to this URL at the top. Um, which has the project that we'll run it in. Um, there's actually there's a JClouds demo in there, um, application similar to the one Adrian had, um, and some text for setting up Hadoop in JClouds, uh, sort of on the machine. So JClouds gives you the bare metal machine. You've still got to set it up. Um, if you just want to run it in localhost, it's pretty easy. We've got the instructions in this README file. This is this is this file's in the project, by the way. Um, and then, um, so after the break, we'll go into, we're setting up a Hadoop cluster. I've actually started it, so it's ready to go, um, but show you some of the nice things that it has done for us. Um, and then we'll run a Hadoop example against it and talk through how that's working. And then flip over to Brooklyn, which will build on that example, stitch it together with a web application, which um, if the network gods mm -hmm. start smiling, we can try to push into several clouds around the world, but otherwise we'll, we'll run from, from localhost. Um, but pointed out the work cluster we provisioned in Amazon. Um, so um, let's have some coffee and come back in 10 minutes or so. Okay. I think the, the coffee seems to be elusive. But, uh, um, so um, for the break, I pointed to, to this URL where you can get um, this properties file. Um, and there's a readme shows a couple different ways to set it up. Now, before you begin, you've got to export two variables that get read. Um, obviously, the cloud you deploy to, um, you need to know your ID and your secret. Um, so those get passed in as an environment variable, or you can set it up in a .word credentials file. Um, once that's done, you can, what we'll do is run the class, um, and it will take a little while, so let me just kick that off now. Um, and, and I'll, it'll say a little bit of a hello. It's going through the bootstrapping cluster and configuring the template. So this will make the call out to JClouds to get the machines. While that's doing its thing, let's go back and look at the code is just a thin shim around loading in a, the recipe, building a cluster spec um, around our recipe configuration, um, and launching it. Um, all the heavy lifting comes from the properties file. So there's nothing in here that knows anything about Hadoop yet, but um, we have promised to talk about Hadoop quite heavily. So shifting over, the relevant line is this one. It says, in this instance, I'm starting one Hadoop job tracker, um, with a, a, well, one machine with the roles of a job tracker and the name node, and four machines that are data nodes and task trackers. Um, is this a parallel or a complementary to our alternative approach to JClouds? Um, As we see templates are... The, we're built heavily on JClouds, um, so it, it relies on JClouds to provision the machines, but also to do a lot of the scripting. So a lot of the, the scripting kind of library conveniences that Adrian showed um, are used heavily by WER and some were actually developed for WER. Um, there's a, a 
couple kind of nice things, getting to know the res return code, being able to specify that something should run as root or not. Um, and one of the nicest um, tricks is where you need to push a file to several machines. Um, rather than copy it to every machine, if you use the JCloud's routines, it will be smart about putting it into an intermediate blob store if it's available, and then copying it from the blob store onto the 5 or 20 or 100 machines. Um, so little things like that speed it up enormously. And that's why JCloud's is sort of feature crept a little bit from just getting machines and storage and networking to actually letting you do some portable scripting. Yeah. Um, I know you must have told it, but I'm late, or I was late. Uh, what is JCloud? I mean, is there any way to find it in like one minute or so? Yeah, if you go to jclouds.org, um, that'll give you a, a, a really quick overview. It's a, a, a portable cloud abstraction. So, library. How would I place it like uh, open a stack or just um, I think in, in, in fairness to the other people, if you want to just read on jclouds.org, um, because we, we did spend an hour talking about that. Um, so um, we ran it as, as code. Um, it's also possible, and, and I apologize for the, the small screens, um, but there's a you can there's a command line tool that comes in where um, you just give it the command, in this case we'll launch the cluster and provide it the, the config file. And the config file is exactly that properties file. Um, so now you see that those exports that we did, our ID and our secret, get used here. You can of course, if it's not Amazon, pick Cloud Servers US or um, your favorite environment. Um, if you have a private OpenStack deployment or, or, or private cloud stack, you can supply that and add an endpoint URL. Um, so, again, it's just jclouds that will provision the machines. Under the covers, when we specified these roles, these roles um, defined sort of the characteristics they require of the machine. Um, you can override that, where it has some other parameters, like um, min ram is a common one. Um, so, whether I run that from the command line or in this program, um, we'll end up seeing output kind of like this, um, telling us completed configuration of the role job tracker, the UI for job tracker is available on this URL. Um, so let's see how far it's gotten to. It's not there yet. So, um, um, the other two conveniences it does, um, it's very nice, it's written out a file for my Hadoop site.xml. And it's also written out a Hadoop proxy.sh. So the this Hadoop site, um, I built one earlier, so I'm expecting that the network might be slow. So let's where? In AWS? <coughs> um, it's both are in Amazon. So what I'll do is go to where uh, where Hadoop sample Alex. And so we see the two files that it's created. Um, and if we look at the Hadoop site.xml, this points out um, the IP address that it's used. There's also a SOC server proxy, which I'll come on to. Um, and you can see that in the output message, it's printed the job track report. So we'll switch over to a browser and prove that it's running. I think maybe we'll, best thing to do is wait for. This to finish. Um, 
It's quite chatty, but the machines have been provisioned, so now we see that it's running various pseudo commands to set things up. And hurrah. Okay, just, just in time. Um, it's configured it and told us where our job tracker URL is. Are the machines set up from the earlier demo, or this is doing it from the beginning? And the one I set up earlier, this one, <laughs> seems not to work. I ran the program fresh, <laughs> and, and this one did work. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so you kind of get the, the, the basic metadata that, that they, they expose um, about the jobs running. Um, and similarly on 70, you get the, yeah, um, telling you see, not much happening in, in, the, in the file space. Um, now, wait, is this cluster, real cluster, or just all in one box? I, you know, the Hadoop, you know. So let me answer that with oh. coming back to the properties file. Right. We set up one machine, which is a job tracker name node. Okay. Um, and so that's why the, I, the host names for the two URLs we saw were the same. It's set up four additional machines, right. data node and for task trackers. Yeah. Um, and somewhere in this output, it will say what those are. Um, I'm going to show just one thing that um, is a frequent gotcha. I've said it, I, I told Word just to use my usual keys. Um, I think, let me make sure I did. This is the one we've just created. So I'll cheat and I'll look at this proxy script that it's created. Um, ah, it's done it as user Alex. That's why it wouldn't log me in as root. So I'm logged in. Um, and if we do a PS aux. We can see proc job tracker and proc name node down in the bottom right. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. this is the thing that was well, done something differently, so maybe it will work. Um, usually, it binds to 50,070 50, and thirty get bound to an external IP, but 8020 and 8021 normally bind only to the intranet. So if you try to go to those ports directly, it doesn't work. Um, so to help you out with that, it creates this proxy script that sets up a SOX proxy on um, port 6666 and not 666. Um, and you notice in this, this one, is telling you that the SOC server proxy is on that port. So what I'll do now is start this do proxy instance. And now come over to this word count example that's in the same directory in the package if you've downloaded it. Um, I'm going to change one thing which um, I called the group my were sample Alex to try to make sure that were Hadoop sample Alex stayed up in case this one didn't. Um, but this is the one that's working now and this is where I'm running the proxy to so I'll make sure it reads that site XML. Um, this stuff is all standard um, Hadoop setting up a configuration. I'm going to read in that config file. Um, the very difficult part um, which um, it's the reason we didn't try to do it on raw jclouds, is manually crafting all the XML files that need to be put onto all the different machines that we set up or, or for the data node, the name node, the job trackers. Um, and it gets worse if you're doing region servers in HBase. Um, and that's the heavy lifting that Hadoop automates for you um, and makes it really nice giving you just this one config file that we read in. Um, 
The thing it can't help you with, of course, is, is specifying the jar to use. There may be a hook to upload a given jar. Um, in this case, we're just going to specify the jar. Because we're running from an IDE, it doesn't by default build the jar, and it won't upload a directory. And the Hadoop mechanism for discovering which jar to send assumes that it's in a jar. So if it's in a directory, that doesn't work. So um, in the readme, there are instructions telling you to just basically jar up the classes from this project, making it a jar. Um, we've done that and set it as the MapReduce jar to use. And what we're actually going to do is we'll, we'll parse the words, uh, the arguments, and, and pick out defaults. We'll have a temp.sampletxt file, um, and we'll put the output into temp out. This is an adaptation of the standard word count example. For those of you not familiar with it, um, um, it's doing MapReduce. Um, the map part is going out to every instance that is hosting um, data, in this case, um, any of the files we supply. Um, and I've amended it slightly. The default word strategy just uses a tokenizer. This splits it up into regexes following this pattern. Um, and for every word that it finds, it puts one into the map um, for it. Um, <coughs> That then comes back and the reducer does a sum. So the reducer is looking at everything with the same key and operating on the set of values. Um, so in this case, we have an iterable of values. So our map task is getting farmed out um, and then the reducer is going to run over that and do a very simple sum. So what we'll end up with is all of the keys being our words and the value being the number of times those words occur. Um, so let's our fingers crossed. So you actually read in from the temp file into the HDFS to the map reduce. Yeah, so, output so to the HDFS and then output to temp file. It's it's a bit of a contrived example here because um, because we've just created the cluster, we don't have anything in it. So what we're doing here is um, the file system is a HDFS API. It's a very familiar file API. Once we have our FS client, we are checking whether the input file exists. Um, if it doesn't, we'll create one. If it does, we're done. Um, and we'll create it. If there's a copy on our local system, we're going to copy the text from the local file so that we're in this case, we're actually counting temp sample.txt, um, which incidentally is just a bunch of random output that I found. Um, so we should see a lot of time Hadoop and build and XML, everything we just saw should show up. Let's see if it's wrong. Right. The drinks in the back. If anybody wants some this water, vitamin, uh, or diet coke, whatever, just help yourself. A question while we wait. Uh, yeah. If we want to, at the time of provisioning, if we want to change the version to use for the job tracker or uh, do a custom version, how, how do we incorporate that in the work? Excellent question. So, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, we're exposes quite a few configuration parameters in Hadoop because that's where it's been used the most. Um, and we should have credited the good folks at Cloudera, especially Tom White, for kind of coming up with this. Um, um, and they expose, they do expose the version. So you can specify, I think this is using point twenty two oh five zero, um, But um, you can specify to use certain CDH Cloudera distributions or version 100, 101, 102. Um, you can specify version. There's, I think, about 20 parameters which they do expose. Um, now, I brought this up earlier in case it got asked. This is the cluster setup. So we said that it is difficult. There are a few more than 20 parameters that you might want to set. Okay. So if, if you're doing things that Hadoop has not incorporated and exposed, then you can either extend Hadoop or not use Hadoop. And so it's 
It's probably more than the 80-20 rule, probably 98% or 2%. 98% of the time you'll be covered here and it will make your life easier. 2% um, of the time you need to do your own thing. Um, even when doing your own thing, when I tried it, the generated XML file are an excellent start. Um, Wait, who generated the XML file? Um, Were has all created right. all the XML files, including my local one. Um, so come back, and the job got mapped out, reduced, it's been completed, spits out a whole bunch of metadata, and then we've put in that sample program code to go onto the file system. Um, read from this directory and output all the files. So there's a file called success that's empty, but the clue is in the name. And then there's the word count. Um, so a lot of zeros, um, a lot of numbers. Then we come down and Hadoop was one that we expected to see a lot. 24,000 mentions of Hadoop in that sample output file. And that compares with XML being only 2,000 times. So, um, it's done what it should. It's not terribly interesting, but um, you can generalize that to any task that needs to be distributed. So how do you... Maybe it's something we added in the Hadoop. How do you, how do you dispute? How do you make... How do you... Uh, how do you tell your processes to distribute the work between the parallelism is all is behind the... Behind yeah. So how do you... Tell uh, the job to you know, which node it gives one, and how do you categorize? So, um, if if anyone in the audience can give a better answer, um, please raise your hand afterwards. But um, I've only ever used it where you farm the jobs out to every node where data that you're using is located. So HDFS is fundamentally a distributed <coughs> file system. So when I write a file to it, I don't really know, nor do I want to know where it's living. Um, but when I run some, when I run a word count, I need to run a word count over all, all the files. Okay? In this case, it was just one file which we created, but if it were a directory or a set of files, um, it will send the job everywhere and it will run over the relevant files there. Um, what, you, what you end up with, though, is a, a whole bunch of pieces of the result, which then need to be reduced or aggregated to create the final result. Yeah, there is a way to decide how many nodes you want. Um, yeah, that's kind of easy. Um, any further questions on the were Hadoop example? And otherwise, we'll, we'll flip over to Brooklyn and show how Brooklyn manages were and manages other pieces of an application. Okay. Um, One question. On, there must be a dictionary of. Uh, standard keywords, the roles of each node. So how easy or difficult is it to add more uh, roles? Within were. Within and were. So the, the first one I did um, was the, the puppet integration. And that took me about two days to do, to basically get the, the guts of it there, and then a bit longer to kind of make it nice. Puppet was more complicated than most because it takes an argument. Um, Name node is a name node. Okay, there are configuration parameters, but they're also nodes. Within Puppet, you, we've added to the semantics, so you say Puppet colon arbitrary string, and that arbitrary string gets treated as a recipe. Um, so if it took me two days to add that complex thing that got into the hearts of the, the dispatch for the action handlers, adding a new role should take less than a day. Um, and in fact, working with um, Channel 4 in the UK, they have a neat thing they've open sourced called C4 Bootstrap, which is similar to things like Galaxy and then somewhat to parts of Bosch, um, in that it basically sets up a T targz file, um, TGZ, but they give me a hard time for <laughs> saying Z. So, um, um, and um, it has a set of init prescripts and post descripts, um, as well as a whole bunch of files. So it kind of does what you expect, it runs the prescripts unloads the files, and then runs the post scripts. Um, and they were using that to do a whole lot of their provisioning, um, and still are. Um, so the, the task we did, they wanted to know about were in Brooklyn, was add in were support for TGZ. 
Um, so they can just basically point that. That was an easy one because there's no argument. Um, and it, it, that, that took a couple hours. Um, once you know your way around it. Um, C4 Bootstrap, what's the name? Um, channel 4 slash C4 Bootstrap is the GitHub project. C4 hyphen Bootstrap, thank you. Um, So we've shown how um, Whir and JClouds let us get um, Hadoop or other applications up into a cloud. Um, but um, there, there's an old saying, you can never step into the same river twice um, because it's always changing. The same is true for cloud. And so you may want to run into a different cloud. Um, you want to change where your application is running from time to time. You certainly want to be able to change the size of your application. Um, depending on load. Um, and ultimately, we think most big applications will run simultaneously spanning multiple clouds. Um, how do we set that up? Um, well, there's a, the trickiest part is the policies, figuring out when do we want to move, when do we want to scale, what are my guidelines for running in multi-cloud, um, what are my policies. Um, so the idea with Brooklyn is that you can code up this logic very easily. Um, and so at the heart of Brooklyn is the notion of a policy. Um, some that come out of the box, there's a, a resizer policy, um, and there's a follow the sun policy um, that um, lets you optimize for, in, in resizer, you supply a, a metric that comes in. Um, in wide area, you supply the, the optimization function for where pieces of an application should run. Um, and the, the code itself is very clean and simple. Um, and the whole sort of scaffolding in Brooklyn and the integrations with um, Wern, and Puppet and Chef, and use of JClouds, um, um, is really to make this as simple as possible. Um, and what that consists of is kind of just moving slowly down the stack, Brooklyn sets up entities which are hierarchical. Um, every entity is a, an autonomic managed element, for those of you familiar with it. For those of you not familiar with, with kind of autonomic control theory, they all expose sensors, um, notifications or attributes, and they all expose effectors, methods or operations. So you can poke them to do things and you can find out what they're doing. That's useful, it's, it's, it's not a, a different idea. Um, but what Brooklyn does is let you express arbitrary things in that way. Frequently software processes, but also groups of software processes. Um, and in, in the exciting new world, platforms as a service instances. Um, all of these entities can be mo mo monitored and managed in the same way. So they're exposing sensors, such as requests per second. All that policies need to do are subscribe to sensors, run some logic, and invoke effectors. So in this case, it's subscribing to requests per second, doing some computation, and then invoking the resize effector on the cluster um, if it should change. Um, so it can be that simple in the end, but it's only that simple if you know what your entities are and you know the instructions for resizing it. If I resize a cluster of JBoss nodes, I'm adding a new JBoss instance. I need to know how do I create that. It's very useful if you knew how the others were created. And kind of the sensible way to do that is to make sure we're using the same process to create the original ones and the new ones. Um, another way to put it is we, need this, we want the same representation of our application. Basically, what we built is what our policies work on. Um, and that's in contrast to the way a huge amount of management gets done, where it's frequently an afterthought. We've built our application, we've manually pushed it out, we've written some scripts to push it out, and now we want it to be dynamic. So we go to a service that will let us monitor our things um, and put our logic there. Well, our logic's sitting there. Our logic is based on the things that we just built and we probably hand-coded, possibly scripted the, the process. And if it's all aware of each other, your life managing these applications gets much simpler. 
So the idea with Brooklyn is that um, you can deploy your applications built your way, tied in to whatever mechanisms you want to use. Um, we tried to do as little as possible in Brooklyn. If there's something good out there, let's use it. Um, but let's make sure we have a representation for what we got. Um, Brooklyn then lets you make managing these entities really part of your descriptor. So when we describe the application we're going to deploy, we're also adding, tacking on the management policies. So we're saying how we're going to be managing it. And Brooklyn lets you express all of this as code um, so that you can reuse portions of it, um, make them classes and use it somewhere else. You can test it, you can track it, and you can share them with other people. So I'll walk through a simple web cluster example and then switch over to showing um, a Hadoop example. So we start off writing, build a, a web cluster. Um, you extend abstract application in Brooklyn. Um, and I pulled in some constants that are specific to this demo. Um, but the first thing, we're going to pull one of the off-the-shelf entities that Brooklyn supplies. This is a controlled dynamic web cluster. The dynamic means that it can grow and shrink. Um, the controlled piece means that it has a controller in it, it by default an Nginx instance. Um, and the, the smarts of recognizing when a new JBoss instance or Tomcat instance joins the cluster, we update Nginx. And when it leaves, we update Nginx. That logic is a policy that's encoded in this entity already, so you don't need to add that. Um, if you don't like that policy, you can subclass this or copy this or change it. That's a nice thing about code. Um, but by default, you can refer to it by name. Um, we can add more configuration, so I, I specified the one required configuration, what WAR file am I deploying. Um, I'll also tell it to run on port 8080 or higher. Um, and that plus is a, a little TSL niceness that says, if 8080 is not available, get a new machine. Why would 8080 not be available if we're running in the cloud? It's a virgin machine. Um, the answer is simple. I like to be able to run it on localhost. Um, so on localhost, 8080 might be free, it might not. If I've deployed one instance, it certainly won't be free for the second one. Um, so I can safely deploy a cluster and manage it on my laptop, which will be a godsend when we come to do the demo, because taking 20 minutes per Amazon machine is, um, will end very quickly. Um, we're also going to drag in a database. Um, and so um, specified MySQL. And we've pointed to a URL for the um, setup script. Um, this, by the way, is an example. Uh, on the Brooklyn website. So if you want to play with this, just go to examples, elastic web cluster. And it talks you through all the steps for setting this up. We don't have the Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop web app example up because we've just been working on it. But you'll note there is an example for specifying a were Hadoop cluster. Um, and the code for that is also very similar. We just specify an entity for were Hadoop cluster. Um, and that has the logic to set up one um, name node job tracker and size minus one data nodes task trackers. And when it gets set up, it actually decomposes what WER has built and tells us about the machines it's created and the roles that are on those machines. It also goes in and gets sensors. Um, we've just put in a few sensors, so there's a lot more information available in the WER classes. But the essential things that we want to know programmatically are the host and port of the job tracker and the URL for the name node and um, where the SOX proxy should be located. Um, so let's, let's, let's stick with a simple example for now. Um, we've added MySQL to our cluster. Um, we could run this at this point and we'd have a, a very nice web cluster come up. It would be load balanced. We would have a database. We would not have any glue between the two. Um, our web instances don't know about our database. We haven't specified that yet. And 
in my experience, that's where the rub in setting up multi-component applications comes in. Um, the approach in Brooklyn, not surprisingly, builds on the fact that you can subscribe to sensors. Um, and we use closures or futures to be able to say, when we get this sensor, we want to use that as a value somewhere else. And most commonly, we say that the a configuration value that gets passed to one entity will come from a sensor of another. And that's what we're doing here. We're going to say that Java options, actually Java options, this is slightly more complicated because JVM options are a map, um, but we're going to put this key into our JVM options, and its value is going to be this sensor attribute, the MySQL URL, coming from this entity, MySQL, with some post-processing. So we're going to turn the MySQL URL into a JDBC URL. This function, by the way, is declared up here. It's just prepending and appending some ugly strings. Um, so the, the result of the attribute when ready call is it returns a, a future. Um, when we attempt to get the configuration on this, we can either get the raw configuration, which will tell us it's a future, but if we're using that value, and in fact, the default Java software process entities um, will read the Java options, um, and that applies to uh, JBoss and Tomcat, vanilla Java process, um, various Java NoSQL entities. Um, the default Java hierarchy in the classes will read these options and set them and pass them to the JVM appropriately. Um, but when it tries to get this config value, if this has not started yet and hasn't published a URL, the get config as opposed to get raw config will see, oh, I've got a future. And at that point, it will just block until that future returns. Um, so there's, in contrast to were, which had a very clean phase one, phase two, phase three process, um, this has no phases or um, an unlimited number of phases, depending on how you think of it. Um, and that tends to make life easier um, because you can just connect things up however you want, but you have to be more careful. Um, you can sort of be lazy. And it gets to be fairly easy to specify a situation where entity one depends on entity two, entity two depends on entity three, and entity three depends on entity one. <laughs> so they all sit there blocking. Um, so um, in general, we don't prevent you from doing that. You know how your application should start up. And I tell you, if you write scripts that do this, waiting for Zookeeper, if you're in the modern era, or waiting for a file to appear, if, if doing it the way we've had to do it for 20 years, you're going to hit the same issue. Um, and I, I think that that power comes with a price and responsibility. But if it's handled right, it can really make your life easier. So what we've tried to do to make it easier to handle right is give you um, visibility of what's going on. So when one is blocked by two, is blocked by three, is blocked by one, you can go in and see, ah, I see that this entity is trying to start and it's blocked because entity two is trying to resize. Um, and you can see exactly where the dependencies lie and what the faults are so you know why it's deadlocked and so you can go and fix it. Um, so at this point, we can run our application. We can manually resize our web cluster. Um, I'm going to add one more thing, and this is what Brooklyn was designed to do. Um, let us attach a policy to do this monitoring for us. Um, so we've added, in this case, the famous resizer policy, and he's going to listen to requests per second. Um, he's being added to the cluster within the web entity. And He's constrained to have a size between one and five. He won't grow beyond five nodes. Um, but the metric is the important one. It's going to expand if this metric ever exceeds 100 over the cluster. And it will scale back if the metric falls below 10. Um, a simple policy, but it, it shows um, how to write more interesting, more complex policies. Where is this uh, policy executed? Um, it runs in Brooklyn. Um, so if it's expressed in Brooklyn, it runs in Brooklyn. Um, it's a very good question because currently when we, if I run this class, um, and in fact we, there's a static main method in the, in the demo, um, it starts a local management node and it runs the application at that management node. Um, 
there's interesting work happening so that you can distribute the management node. Um, a lot of the kind of the config keys are not dealt with as fields, but as a map so that the data is more easily tracked in a data grid. Um, and so there's work going on, actually two explorations, one using Infinispan, one using Hazelcast, um, to provide a distributed management plane. That's not out yet, so right now it's running in one management node. Um, but that will execute the policies. Um, in the distributed world, it tries to run the policies as close to the entity as possible. Um, there are some people looking at trying to get sort of a very small distributed management node on the same machine as the entity. Um, so we can manage a, a process on the same machine. You tend to manage a cluster within the cluster. And then when you're making wide area decisions, you need information from all the clusters. So that will run in one or two clusters of your choice. So in the Hadoop cluster, you have a, a machine running Brooklyn. Um, when, we, when we come to, so if we started the Hadoop example that I flashed up earlier, that um, we could go into Amazon start Brooklyn there and run the where Hadoop app from there. If I run it from my laptop, the management's actually happening on my laptop. So that's the other reason the distributed management plane becomes very nice. It provides an easy way for me to start it on my laptop, spin up a bunch of machines, spin up other Brooklyn management nodes, farm out the responsibility to the other, other nodes, and then close my laptop, and, which is what you really want to do. Um, right now, in a production world, we SSH to the same cluster and start the production or the staging version in the cluster. Um, which is not ideal, but it, but it, it works for now. Um, there's also some work in serializing it so you can rebind it and restart it if it goes down. So you have you have some resilience at that level already. So how yeah. do you get the So the first is basically what is the size of the root cluster that you're managing and what's the and the second one is the problem, like not the problem with the loop, but it's the hygiene that is, I look at basically the data from the SQL coming in, the clusters, and then the Java guys running all the programs and then stuff happening, staying out there. Or I'm good hygiene to clean up the disk space. What is your, how are you, are you, are you looking at that space or this is something that... This is an interesting question. Um, it's, it's not something that we've looked at specifically in Hadoop, cleaning it up, um, but... Um, That's a resource, right? Um, yeah, there, there's no reason why you couldn't add an extra process or a policy that's going to pull it periodically and see if instead of resizing, we're going to say if... if no, you, you can't do it that way because sometimes you want to keep the data. I mean, you need to have a configuration which... So I, I, that, that's, that's exactly why the policies are code that you can control. So um, if you don't like my strategy, you can write your own strategy. If your strategy is better than mine, I'll adopt your strategy. So, so is, is somebody doing work in that space or whatever? Um, I don't know of anyone writing policies against Hadoop currently. Um, and the reason for that is, as Adrian alluded, were doesn't yet expose resize. Um, so it shouldn't be that hard, and uh, hopefully we have a, a Google Summer of Code student adding that to Hadoop. So um, at the end of the summer, we may have resize in Whir, which makes it trivially easy to add resize in Brooklyn, and then we can stick a resizer on it. And then we're very happy. Yeah. So to um, just give a, a little walkthrough of what we've seen and how entities become hierarchical, we've focused on making a cluster. Um, I'll now switch over and say, well, we want to run multi-region um, and multi-tier. So um, if this is our physical architecture with a presentation tier, some processing, a, a data tier, in Brooklyn, that gets organized this way. We've talked about our cluster. Um, we'll have a fabric consists of clusters of the same type. And in the same way we had a controlled cluster with a load balancer, you can have a controlled fabric with a GeoDNS service sitting in front of our web clusters. Um, we have our processing cluster and our, 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 our data cluster. Um, the policies attach to any entity anywhere in the hierarchy. And that, in our experience, turns out to be very useful because different logic you want done at different levels and in most environments decided by different people. So at the very low level, I'll attach a, a restart policy against a node. Um, 
So if, if something fails, let's just restart the process. Um, if maybe a maximum of three times in five minutes. Um, and after that, we're going to emit a sensor that will travel up the way to our parent entity, the cluster, who will have a policy. Um, and there can be a resize policy in there looking at it. There can also be a, a health check policy. If we've gotten notice that one node keeps rebooting, um, let's kill that node and get a different one. Um, going up the level to the fabric, you typically attach policies for which regions should we run in and at what scale. Um, and for anything that is stateful, it's typically um, which instances should be managed here. So the chat room example we talked about, the open cloud conf chat should be hosted in California right now. But if we all go to bed and 12 hours later people are desperate to see what we've said in, in Japan, all the access comes from a Japan and the kind of wide area follow the sun policy will look at a particular entity, in the case of a chat room, and move the master data for that chat room into Tokyo. Um, the other nice thing about doing it as hierarchies is that we can swap out, um, not just at the low level process level, swap out Tomcat for JBoss for WebSphere, but moving up the way we can swap out a web cluster for CloudStack or um, AppFall or Staccato um, or OpenShift or Cloudify or App Engine your favorite one. You can also combine those, and you can combine a mix and match with an Amazon instance. So, um, so tricks actually when they do um, things is like, you need to educate me over here is they don't want the data to be sitting outside of the, uh, the location. So in the chat thing, I presume something similar also would be happening. Right? So we restrict it to the data not leaving the. Yes. Um, so I mean I, I'm. I'm talking very much about the, the capabilities. That doesn't mean that you have to. Um, and one of the things that's very important to us, um, since we put the um, ISO um, 3166 information into J clouds, we know if a cloud is officially in a jurisdiction. Um, there's also support for working with Utrace and MaxMind and various um, IP locator services um, in the product. MaxBind actually have a really nice free database you can download and if you downloaded it this will pick it up and use it. Um, and so when I flip over to the demo you should see that you should, earlier it was like correctly identifying us in Sunnyvale. Um, so if you want to attach a policy that says um, well yeah try to do load balancing unless there is a constraint and certain things are constrained and never allowed to leave America or in Europe they're frequently never allowed to enter America um, um, you can add those policies and those are exactly the things that, that we find ourselves doing in the real world um, so and the, one of the reasons we can swap out these clusters is because we are operating as code we are strongly typed we are conforming to interfaces so there's an elastic Java web app service interface, which most of the things on the screen follow. Um, so I can get, Cloud Foundry can give me one of those instances. Um, OpenShift can give me one of those instances. Or if I'm just running on JCloud's environment, I can create one of those machines, or one of those clusters. Um, the power of JCloud's is to get us into lots of VM clouds. Um, tempted almost to call them bare metal clouds, but the, it's not real metal. And there are, is metal as a service, which um, Adrian will happily talk about, um, and is very cool. But anywhere that I can get compute, I can build lots of things, and JClouds lets me get into many of, many of those. We're not tied to JClouds, um, certainly for the locations. Localhost is treated specially because there are a lot of shortcuts, optimizations that we want to do. JCloud does support localhost, and when you go into WER, there's been some recent work that WER will actually treat localhost and set up the JCloud's bring your own node IP account and telnet to, to 127001. Um, occasionally it works out beautifully for something simple like Zookeeper. Hadoop currently isn't very happy um, if, because things step on each other's toes. It, if it thinks it's running on three machines, it expects to run on three machines. Um, um, but the, the interesting thing, uh, we think, is where you're blending um, virtual machines with services and platform as a service that can offer. So everything so far has been very complicated. The, the goal is to simplify this as much as possible. 
So um, everything that's faded out is stuff that is necessary, but you don't necessarily need to know about it or declare it. If you want to, you can. But the essentials that you need to bring to build an application like this is your WAR file, some config for GeoDNS. Uh, in the case of Monterey or um, other processing environments, Hadoop, it's different kinds of processing, by the way. I mean, Monterey is, is not competing with Hadoop, but I um, mean, Hadoop, it's the same idea. We have to push out our code. Um, and, then, um, and if we've got a, a data source, we probably want to put a schema or a creation script in there. Maybe put some policies in Brooklyn, credentials for JClouds, and that's your recipe. Um, so coming back, we saw earlier, it looks like this for uh, a cluster. Um, there's neat work going on to express it as XML, or can I, I tend to prefer the JSON representation. Um, so there's a, a nice REST API where you can um, describe your application and push it up there. You don't have access to the programmatic facilities. So one thing that we've not been able to do is specify the code that does the post-processing on the URL coming from MySQL. Um, so at some level you need code, but if that code has been provided for you and someone's given an off-the-shelf way to specify a config property into MySQL, then we can just pick up the named entities, the named policies, apply some configuration, and JSON gives us a lighter way to do that. Um, that's very much work in progress, so if you're interested in participating, um, come to Brooklyn, Brooklyn Central GitHub site. There's an issue. There's a Brooklyn dev at Google mailing list. Um, the nice thing about JSON, though, is that it lends itself to building one of these, a drag-and-drop path, where we have a big palette of things that we can configure. Um, the coders can go and extend the library fairly easily. Um, the middleware teams can customize those, and then the engineers can just get what they need and use it. Um, so let's switch over now. And instead of looking at the web cluster, uh, let's bring up a web fabric with Hadoop. Um, now, one of the examples um, in there sets up the web fabric, and so we in inherit from that. Um, fabric is our term for clusters in several regions. So um, we have, we'll make a web fabric. Um, and we just build dynamic fabric, which just means we can add and remove locations willy-nilly. Um, there's nothing web-specific in the class, but our factory is one of these, I mentioned the Elastic Java Web App Service interface. Um, and so I give it that factory. And that factory has the smarts to know if I'm going to um, a machine location or a machine provisioning location, i.e. A, a normal cloud, then I will roll out the, the NGINXs and the JBosses that I need. Um, however, if I'm going to an OpenShift world, then I'm going, I can't get a machine, but I do know how to start in location OpenShift, and it's a different mechanism. So it creates a different entity, but it will still conform to this interface. So I'm guaranteed to get a bunch of web app services as my clusters that make this fabric. Um, the next piece is the geoscaling DNS. Um, so I mentioned that the config was my uh, war file, which we're actually configuring that at the bottom. Um, GeoDNS needs to be configured with a username, um, password, primary domain. Um, it's somewhat complicated. Um, once you've set it up and added three, these three fields to a Brooklyn Properties file, which I think is described in the README or the examples, um, that just works. Um, and CloudSoft has set up a, a domain geopaz.org that you're welcome to prepend your own unique prefix and everything should work. So you need a geoscaling account for these two, but you don't need your own DNS domain. Um, so, um, with that, you can set up the GeoDNS. What this will do, in the same way as the Nginx, it will listen to new clusters coming up in the web fabric. And in fact, let's, uh, this target entity provider means that GeoDNS is going to look at the children of this entity. Whenever there's a new one or one goes away, 
he's going to update the GeoDNS records. So if we get a new cluster in Seattle, we'll add Seattle as the location. It's also creating the rules that um, we know the IP of Seattle, the GeoDNS knows your IP, there's some complex trigonometry to figure out the, which location is closest to you, but it does that on the server script. In fact, Geoscaling do that for free, which is pretty nice. Um, there are commercial um, alternatives available. Um, but this one um, we like because it's free. Um, the next piece is where we've added our Hadoop cluster. And we mentioned this command. Um, I think someone said, how do we determine the size? I could change that to five. Um, I've also specified MinRAM. I've set up quite a bit of MinRAM. Um, in fact, all we're doing in our web app is essentially some chat and some um, word counting, which I'll, I'll come back and show. So let's tune that down. Um, the final challenge is specifying um, every JBoss instance or every web, everywhere the web app is running needs to know the um, have access to the site.xml file for Hadoop. So this is where the wiring gets tricky, and this is where there there is some somewhat ugly code that we're about to see in the second half of this file. Um, I'm not going to hide that, um, but the real world things do get ugly. And actually, if it's half a page of things that aren't too ugly, I hope, um, that's a lot nicer than a lot of the alternative ways, because fundamentally what we have to do, as we saw earlier, is get the site.xml file on these machines, make sure that the web app is configured to read that Hadoop site XML as its configuration for everything it does against the Hadoop cluster. We also need to start the Hadoop proxy. Um, so the first thing we've done um, is said that well, we're going to start the Hadoop cluster in the first location and we're starting the web fabric in all the other locations. Once, and these two braces, by the way, is Groovy syntax for a closure. Um, you're not obliged to use Groovy. Some of the examples have a pure Java equivalent. But it makes several things simpler in that I don't have to say um, lists dot holding this um, or the really horrendous new callable call this. Um, but what we've done is created a group called WebVMs, which is going to detect every new entity. And if it's a JBoss 7 server, it will join this group as a member. So um, membership is a kind of an orthogonal um, characteristic. Autonomic computing likes a strict hierarchy, so every entity has a parent. So we saw earlier our were roles belong to a were instance, which is a machine. The were instances belong to the were cluster, which is, for instance, the Hadoop cluster or um, an elastic search cluster, if you want. Um, those clusters typically belong to fabrics, and the fabric belong to applications. It doesn't have to break up that way, but you are constrained to having one parent, so one official manager. Um, but you can have any number of memberships. So group is the way that we allow what's sometimes called horizontal communication. Um, so this web VM is basically just grouping all of the, the web processes. Um, and then we've added a policy um, to this group and start the policy. And as soon as we, once we've started the policy, we want to run over any machines that happened already. What this policy is doing is subscribing to every member in that group. So anytime a new JBoss instance comes up or goes away, um, or in this case, whenever the service up URL changes, we're going to run setup machine against that entity. So anytime we get a new JBoss instance, we're going to drop into this method. This is where the configuration gets a little bit hairy, but I'll, I'll talk through everything we're doing, and if there's a cleaner way, I'd love to know it. Um, I'm sure there is one, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to find it, but this is really just something we've been working on for the past um, five or six days. Um, and to be honest, we weren't expecting to have to do so much ugly wiring. We knew there was some, um, but I, th I think we're is taking care of 80% of it, but even the remaining 20% is, is pretty bad. Um, so we specified above that we're starting our Hadoop cluster um, with this name. And 
it generates our site.xml file to disk. So what we're going to do, the first thing is copy that file that was on our local machine created by Were over to this file, which is on the machine location where that JBoss is running. So for every entity, we find out where it's running and we get an SSH handle to it. Copy the site.xml across. So that's step one. Step two might be, and any guesses what step two is? We want to start the proxy. So they told it to start the proxy. Um, that failed because we didn't have our key installed on the machine. So step two is not to start the proxy, but to copy our key over. So we drill into Hadoop to find the private key file. Um, and were is quite generous, as is jclouds. It lets you define your key in a couple different ways. I can point my key to a file, or I can supply it as text, basically. So if a file's been supplied, we're done. If there was no file supplied, we need to find out the contents of the key that it's using. So get private key as opposed to get private key file, and serialize that to a file. Now we have this file. We're going to do the same trick and copy that file over to the machine and call it this. We're nearly done. Next, we need to build the proxy. Um, this was lifted directly from some WER code that generates that proxy.sh. Um, I think we'll put a pull request in to refactor it so we don't need to copy all this code. But we needed to copy it because we've changed the location of the private key um, on the remote machine. Um, users slash Alex doesn't exist up there. It's called home dot slash Alex if it exists at all. A um, bunch of other settings and proxy URL. This generates the command. We're then wrapping it in a while true with some logging so that that proxy will stay up. And finally, we don't run it yet, but we do the required ch mods on the key and the script, and then we run it. And at this point, our remote web machine has been configured so it has the Hadoop proxy. It has this site file. But we still need to tell the web app where to find the site file. So the final thing we do is define a URL. The first part of the URL reads a root <coughs> URL sensor from the entity. So we know the URL that that JBoss instance is reporting. We're going to bypass Nginx and GeoDNS and talk directly to that machine, um, assuming that's permitted. If it's not permitted, you'll have a trickier job. Um, we're going to invoke configure on it, and we're going to specify the key as a URL, and that URL is this file. Um, so this configure.jsp will come back to, but that's a, a way to specify some of the configuration settings that the web app exposes. So we're configuring it in a different way to what we did before, where we did dash D at startup time, now we're doing it at runtime after it's running. Um, that was all that we needed. Um, so once that's done, we can run that, and we can point it to several different locations. Um, I've tried running it about eight times and not had any success, um, probably because by the time we've added the Hadoop jars to our WAR, it's 20 megabytes. And we're uploading that 20 megabytes to several clusters simultaneously. Um, but so I'm not going to be able to show that just now. But what I can show, <coughs> here you can see the timeout errors that it had with the SSH. Um, this is a one I've deployed to localhost, and it's still running. This was a very simple cluster um, with the JBoss and the Nginx. And we can see Nginx as the downstream targets. Nginx is on 8,000, downstream targets on 8080. I like the name of this server, in any case, JSON. Um, and so that's been pushed out. Yeah. 
and I'll do refresh five or six, uh, lots of times. And when I've done that, you can see that the request per second, which was zero for the last 10 seconds, has now shot up to six. Um, and that should refresh every couple of minutes, um, seconds. Um, I'll also show this has the Hadoop chat room and word count. We can come in. This is the configure.jsp page that we invoke programmatically. Um, and you can see, I can just specify the URL to the Hadoop site, um, or I can specify the contents precisely. There's also a SQL database version of this chat room. But that's the configuration. I suspect while I've been talking, my proxy has fallen over. But let's try it and see. This chat room app is um, reading and writing comments to the HDFS. Um, this isn't looking promising, is it? Um, Bring the proxy back up, keep our fingers crossed. Um, actually, the old, um, this is a new set of machines, isn't it? programmatically specify the XML, or manually specify what would have happened programmatically. This was started pointing at the, the old one, um, so let's point it at the new one and hope that this one is running. <coughs> Hurrah! So we have our chat room app. Um, the Hadoop is hosted up in Amazon, and that's been fairly stable, but um, sending up lots of web apps and uploading the big WAR file. Doesn't have much luck, but let's put in a message. Um, for instance, no sleep till Brooklyn. When we hit submit, this is uploading it to the HDFS. The list of messages is taken from that HDFS. Um, do we have another message someone wants to supply so that it's not a conjurer's trick? Someone give me some message so we can Brooklyn show you. Dodgers. Sorry? Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah, excellent. They're the one visiting. Do they have a message to say? 1948 World Champs. <laughs> He's not a plant, by the way. So that's gone. Now the fun part, we're going to run the word count example over this data. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> 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 What's happened here? Um, Does the code expect a minimum of three messages? No, no. It's, 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 um, I think it's not happy that we've tweaked the configuration too many times. And I, I set up both contents and URL. And that, and so. Um, <coughs> I'll close just by showing the code and then take for the web app. This is also <coughs> included in Brooklyn. Um, so under web apps, we have the Hadoop web app and the Hadoop world jar. Um, and in the jar, we have our Hadoop word count code. So it's, it's really running the same word count. And I'll play with it and find out why it's not. But, um, um, and then over here, we have our web app. So configure is fairly boring, but um, the Hadoop chat and the Hadoop word count, um, word count's probably the most interesting. Um, we are literally doing our Hadoop calls right here. So we're reading from those two properties we've set. Um, loading the configuration, the Hadoop configuration in this block against word count. 
creating our file system. And this is something that Paul or someone else may have a cleaner way to do. But um, currently, we are listing the files on the remote file system from the local machine or from the web app machine. Getting that list of files and then for each of them specifying them as input to the job and then we're pushing the job out there. Is there a cleaner way to do that? Can I just specify a glob? I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's... Yeah. I mean, if you ran... It's a good idea. So we move the main out of this, put it into the Hadoop jar file. That separate jar project, of course, was to make a small jar that we're pushing out to the Hadoop cluster. Um, yeah. Um, so that's running it. Um, and then we're going through the file in the output directory, and just like we saw earlier in the kind of example we ran against were, now we're doing it in the context of a web app. Um, and I was really hoping we would see Brooklyn appear twice, Dodgers once, 1948 once, um, but it was not to be. It's really not happy. Um, ah, but what I... It did at least correctly locate our local host as being in Sunnyvale. Uh, and it, it is sunny here in Sunnyvale, and it is almost 4 o'clock, so I have a, a few questions. Um, we'll stick around or, or go for a beer. But, um, well, thank you all very much for your time and interest.